You know, we sing about Christ as the cornerstone, and uh, we ought to. We ought to sing about Christ as the cornerstone, but that's borrowed from Psalm 118. And in Psalm 118, there is a prophecy that says about Christ that says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this was of the Jews in the New Testament when they rejected Christ. And uh, speaking of the scripture, it says, uh, speak, quoting, quoting about Christ, but referencing Psalm 118, they said, do you not know that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? And so the idea of, of the cornerstone being Christ, we don't think about it very much anymore, but in, in our culture, the idea of a cornerstone is the idea that you would place the cornerstone and then the rest of the building would be built off of that cornerstone so that the, the shape of the building would be square, that it would be true. And, and so when we, say, when we say and we proclaim through song that Christ is our cornerstone, what we're saying is that he is the measure of our lives. He is the means by which we give shape to our life and dimension to our life. Our lives are built off of Christ. He is our standard. And so I love being able to sing that. And I hope that maybe the next time you're thinking about Christ as the cornerstone, you, you will ask that that be true of your life, that your life be shaped and built off of who Jesus is. Join me, if you would, in Psalm 22 as we continue the longest Advent series ever. And we, uh, uh, we started our Advent series nine weeks ago. I was joking in an earlier service, maybe the first service, they all kind of run together, um, that in a couple of years, I'll start our longest Advent series ever the first Sunday of January. And we'll just go all that. We'll just say this whole year is the Advent, the coming of Christ, and, and we'll, we'll cover it all. But Psalm 22 is where we are today. Here's what we have on tap. Our theology is this. The Psalms are songs that speak to the coming Savior and the longing of the people for him. The application is we ought to desire with deep longing the return of Jesus. And our prayer is, come, Lord Jesus, come. Family focus this week is this. Jesus came once and is coming again. Jesus came once and is coming back. So this idea that the Psalms are songs that speak to the coming Savior and the longing of the people for him. To be fair, not all of the Psalms speak directly to Christ, but many of them do. And as we consider the Psalms, as we think about the Psalms, uh, a lot of them are written by David. I grew up thinking that King David wrote all the Psalms. He wrote a little over half. And, uh, and, and so David writes in the Psalms of who Christ is, but David also writes about kind of his emotions. And when he's had a good day, he blesses the Lord. And when he's had a hard day, he asks for the Lord to intervene. And there's a lot of emotion caught up in it. But the Psalms speak a lot about Jesus. We've already referenced Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 in this series. We could do Psalm 8, Psalm 16. There are a lot of different Psalms. You're going, well, Ryan, that's only five. I understand. But there really are a lot of different Psalms we could do an entire probably annual series on, on the Psalms and how they are referenced and used in the New Testament. But I'm going to start with us today in Psalm 22. And this Psalm is particularly interesting because it speaks about the crucifixion of Jesus. And Psalm 22, I'm not going to keep reading. I'm just going to read the first line and then pause so you don't get frustrated with me because I know I do that all the time. But uh, Psalm 22, one starts this way, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you might recognize that from Matthew 27, 46, where Jesus is on the cross. And from the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I was taught all growing up, I was taught my entire life uh, that God forsook Jesus. I've been preaching now for 30 years, for the first 20 years of my preaching. I preached that God forsook Jesus. And I'm going to show you today why I don't believe that God forsook Jesus. And if you have questions, I encourage you to ask them of me. All right? So we've made it through the first three services with everybody seeming to be okay. But if next week our congregation's cut in half, uh, then we'll know. All right? So uh, here's the thing. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, the Father is always with me. Jesus says that in John chapter 8. Now, that's important because Jesus says that about his Father. But of more significance to me is John chapter 16, where the night that Jesus is arrested, at this point, Judas has already left to betray Christ. Jesus is alone with the 11. And Jesus says to the 11, uh, you are all about to leave me. You're going to forsake me. And he says, but the Father is always with me. The Father never leaves me. So Jesus himself has said at least twice in the book of John that the Father is always with him and doesn't leave him. So that has to count for something. 
that Jesus says that. Furthermore, in John 14, also the last night of the life of Christ, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He talks about, he says, I and the Father are one. He says that in John chapter 8. We know, we know then that Christ says, I and the Father are one. Christ also says, the Father never leaves me or forsakes me. And so why then would Jesus say from the cross, here's the other thing. Uh, let's get into the weeds. Ask me later about Hebrews 13. Uh, why would Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if I was trying to call your attention to a movie, okay, if I was trying to call your attention to a movie, I might be able to do something like this and say, we're going to need a bigger boat. What movie have I just referenced? Jaws. Super easy, right? When I was 13 years old, my sister Haley, who was 10 at the time, she and her friend wanted to go see a movie. She asked my mom if she and her friend could just go by themselves. And my mom said no, and the friend's mom said no. And they said, well, you can go if Ryan goes with you. He's 13. We'll drop you off if Ryan goes with you. And I was like, I don't want to go see a dumb princess movie with 10-year-old girls. No, thank you. Like, I, I was... I have never in my life been cool. I was certainly not cool at 13, and I was so afraid that this would hurt any chance I ever had of being cool because I was with my 10-year-old sister and her 10-year-old friend at a princess movie, and I got to say I was wrong because The Princess Bride was like one of the greatest movies <laughs> ever, right? It was such a great movie, and I'm so glad I went because I probably wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't been made to see it with my sister, and all I got to do is say, as you wish, and if you throw yourself down a hill while saying that, you're like, man, I know exactly what movie you're talking about, right? Um, stop that rhyming, and I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? And you're like, dude, it's a great movie. You only have to say a line to call your mind to it. Let me give you another example. It's right there in your Bible where you're already looking. If I were to say to you, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What have I just given you? 23rd Psalm, okay? And those of us who grew up in and around church, do you remember that there was a time that like, you, you had your little New Testament Bible, and it had the New Testament, but it had the Psalms, but the, like the 23rd Psalm would be like in the front, you know, or something like that. It was in the opening pages of the Bible, or you were taught to memorize it from the time you were very little, or your grandmother had it in calligraphy next to her hand towel in the bathroom, so that as you're drying your hands, there's the 23rd Psalm. It's either that or footprints in the sand. Everybody's grandmother had one of those two things in the bathroom, um, and, and like we, we know it. Now, Chapters weren't assigned to the Bible until 1200 AD. There were no chapters in Jesus' day. So if Jesus wanted to call the mind of his audience, he's hanging on the cross, but he has an audience. If Jesus wanted to call the mind of his audience to a particular text, how would he do that? He would quote the first line. Okay? This is how rabbis would teach. This is how the Jewish rabbis would teach. Okay, so for example, next week we're going to be in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And that was how you would identify that psalm. Or the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news. Isaiah 61. Or behold the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 42. And so what you would do is these opening lines were the ways for people to know what you were talking about. Okay. Now you and I are not first century Jews. And also as Christians, we're not really good. If we're just being honest, we're not really good at knowing the Bible. But the Jews who were gathered around the cross that day did know the scripture. And when Jesus said, my God, my God, I have you forsaken me. He was calling their attention to this Psalm. And let me show you why it's because this Psalm deals with the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, if you don't write in your Bible, that's okay. But if you're okay with writing in your Bible, I I like it because I make all sorts of notes in, my, in here for me. If you're okay writing in your Bible, I would recommend that next to verse 1, you jot down Matthew 27, 46, so that you can remember where that's quoted from in the New Testament. Okay, So Matthew 27, 46. And then he says here in Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you don't answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, you are enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you our fathers cried out and were rescued. They, in you they trusted and they were never put to shame. But I am a worm, I'm not a man. I am scorned by, the man, my, by mankind. I am despised by all the people. This is Psalm 22, 7. Listen carefully. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads at me. 
All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads at me. If you're writing in your Bible, next to verse 7, jot down Matthew 27, 39 and 40. Matthew 27, 39 and 40. And in Matthew 27, 39 and 40, it says all the people gathered around the cross mocked him and wagged their heads at him. Now, what does that say in Psalm 22, 7? That the people who gathered around him mocked him and wagged their heads, shook their heads at him. Look at verse 8. Here's what they're saying as they're mocking him. Verse 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let God deliver him. Let God rescue him if he delights in him. So, Fast forward, if you're jotting notes, Matthew 27, 43. You want to put that next to Psalm 22, 8. Matthew 27, 43. And you'll never guess what the people who were mocking Jesus said. They said, well, if God likes him so much, let God rescue him. Let God deliver him if God likes him. So that more than 700 years, more than 700 years before Christ, David's writing this. And now it is unfolding at the cross while Jesus is there being crucified. Keep going with me. Verse 9. Yet you were the one who took me from the womb. You've caused me to trust upon you from my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near to me, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. Let's pause here. I'm poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. It's argued, and we could go either way on this, but it's argued that as Jesus knelt to the cross, was lifted up on the cross, and the cross was dropped into the hole, likely it dislocated his shoulders. It's argued that. But as far as my heart melting within me and being poured out like wax, do you remember what they did to Jesus after he died? Do you remember how they took the spear and shoved it into his side, and blood and water flowed as they pierced the heart? Right? And here it says what? My heart is like wax, melted within me. It's poured out. And so next to uh, verse 14, I want you to jot down John 19, 34. John 19, 34. Verse 15, it says this. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue sticks to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. Jot down John 19, 28, when Jesus from the cross said, I thirst. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. He goes on to say in verse 16, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. Like a lion, my hands and my feet. Another rendering of it says, They have pierced my hands and my feet. What is that a picture of? The cross, right? He goes on to say in verse 17, I can count all of my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. Next to verse 17, you want to write down John 19.32. John 19.32. Now, you might not know this, but according to the book of Leviticus, if you were going to make an offering to God, whether it was a lamb or a goat, whatever it was, you couldn't have, it couldn't have any broken bones. If it had any broken bones, it was a profane offering to God. When Christ was on the cross, he had a thief on his right and a thief on his left, and they had to get the guys off the cross quickly because that day was preparation day for the Passover. And so they come and they break the, th- the, the legs of the thief and the legs of the other thief, and they come to Jesus to break his legs, but they don't break him. Why? He's already dead. So they don't break the legs of Jesus, right? And so when it says here in verse 17, I can count all my bones, it's a reference to the fact that they didn't need to break his bones. His bones hadn't been broken because you couldn't have broken bones and be still an offering to the Lord. Look at verse 18 of Psalm 22. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Next to that, you want to write Matthew 27, 35. Matthew 27, 35. You'll remember that at the feet of Jesus, at the cross, they took his garments, the soldiers did, and they divided them among themselves, but they got down to the tunic. There was a tunic that was made of one solid piece, no seams, and they didn't want to rip it and divide it amongst themselves, so they cast lots to see whose tunic it would be, to see who could win it. And that's quoted for us right here in Psalm 22, 18. Again, word for word, what's happening at the cross. Now keep going with me. Verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. That's quoted in reference to Jesus in Hebrews 2.12. That right there, verse 22, is quoted about Jesus in Hebrews 2.12. Verse 23, 
You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. Now listen to what, now remember where this started. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, the, the person, the, the principal character, the subject of this, he's calling out to God. And listen to what he says in verse 24. For he, for God, has not despised or hated the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he hears him when he cries to him. For God has not hidden his face from the affliction of the afflicted. He hasn't hidden his face from them. Now, I don't know about you, but for 20 years, the way that I preached it, and for the 20 years prior to me starting to preach the way that I was taught it, was that God hid his face from Jesus when he was on the cross. That God turned his face away. You will not find that anywhere in the scripture. Not a single place. It does not occur once in the text. It does occur in several Christian songs, none that we sing here, because we don't think that that's correct. <laughs> But it does occur in several Christian songs. So if you're like, oh, but, but the father turned his face away. I know that. I mean, I mean, I remember that. I've been told that my whole life. We sing that. Not a single place does it occur in the scripture. And not only that, but Psalm 22, 24 says what? Literally says what? He does not turn his face away. Okay? He does not turn his face away. So if Jesus says, the father is always with me. The father never leaves me. And if Jesus says, though you abandon me, the father will not forsake me. And if the scripture says the father does not turn his face away from him, then what conclusion ought we to come to? That the father is still with Christ. How can the Trinity be broken? How can the father and son that have perfect unity not have perfect unity? If we're supposed to look at the relationship between the father and the son as an example for God's relationship to us, and if God can forsake the son, then what gives us a chance? Right? Not only that, not only that, but Jesus in John chapter 12, the last night of the life of Christ, John from 12 through, uh, 12 through 18 is the last night of the life of Christ. It's a lot of chapters covering the last night. But in John chapter 12, Jesus says this, Father, my heart is troubled. What should I say? Save me from this hour? No, it's for this reason I've come to this hour. So Father, glorify your name. And God answers from heaven and says, I have glorified my name and I'll glorify it again. Meaning this, the cross is the means by which God was what? glorified glorified go read john chapter 17 read the first two verses of john chapter 17 and you're going to find that jesus in his prayer moments before he's arrested says by this are you glorified and by this am i glorified so the cross glorifies the father and the son and that's right in line with what Paul says in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and towards the end of that section where he says that Christ was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, and therefore, because of Christ's obedience in the cross, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that's above every name. The cross was for the glorification of the Father and for the glorification of Jesus. Not only that, but we're invited to join Christ at the cross. Anyone who comes after me, Jesus says, must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me daily. 1 Peter chapter 4, Christ suffered on the cross, setting an example so that we too would suffer like he suffered. Hebrews 13, let's go outside this, the camp and like Christ bore the reproach from wicked men, let us also bear the reproach for the sake of God. Let us also be cursed for the sake of God. Not cursed by God, cursed for the sake of God. By who? The people, the wicked men. And so here Jesus is on the cross, not at all forsaken, because just 12 hours ago he says, the Father won't ever leave me. But preaching to the crowd, look at how I'm fulfilling even the scripture now. Look at how everything, like think about it for a minute. You're there, you're a first century Jew, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now hear me out, okay? I, I, I've been preaching for nearly 30 years, and I'm going to tell you something. I hate my first 20 years of preaching. If I could go back and throw it all out, I would, okay? I can't do that. There is always some really well-meaning person who comes up to me after the service and says, hey, I bet God still used it. Balaam's donkey spoke to Balaam. In King James, you call donkey something else, right? So God can use an to accomplish his purpose, right? <laughs> so... I was a donkey's Balaam, a Balaam's donkey. <laughs> See, that's what I was for 20 years. I don't doubt that God used me. It doesn't mean that I was right, okay? And I want to handle the scripture correctly. 
If I could go back and undo the first 20 years, I would. But let me tell you how I preached Matthew 27, where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I would preach that verse, and then I would try to appeal to the emotions of the crowd, and I'd be like, anybody in here ever been forsaken by your mom or your dad? Been forsaken by the people that were supposed to love you? Been forsaken and abandoned by the people who were supposed to care for you? Anybody in here ever had your parents come and sit you down and say, you're not our son, we want nothing to do with you ever again. As far as we're concerned, we only have daughters. Anybody in here ever stand before your parents and have them tell you you're an embarrassment? We hope that when God made you, he broke the mold because the world shouldn't have you in it. You ever felt forsaken like that? Oh, man, that's how Jesus felt in this moment. And I appeal to the emotion of the people, and I don't teach the text, and I wish I could take it back, but I can't. I can't undo that. And the people are like, man, I can't believe God felt that way about Jesus. He didn't. He loved him. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 5, I alluded to it earlier. I thought, let's go ahead and do it anyway. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 5, the Father will never leave you nor forsake you. If that's true of us, isn't it true of the Son? Now, you're asking this question. I know you already are. You're going, but didn't Jesus bear our sins? Yes, he did. Just like the sacrifices of the Old Testament bore sins. But you know what you never find in the, in the book of Leviticus about the sacrifices and their sins? You know what you never find? That Jesus hated those sacrifices. Every offering of the Lord in, or to the Lord in Leviticus, it says that he counted it as a fragrant offering, precious in his sight. That's how God viewed Jesus. This is a fragrant offering, precious in my sight. So why would Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, to 21st century people, we're like, well, I guess God forsook them. But to 1st century Jews, Psalm 22 would have leapt to their mind, and they would have been like, oh, my goodness, look, they're casting lots for his clothing. Oh, my goodness, they didn't break his legs. Oh, my goodness, they pierced his side. Look at what the people are saying. Look how they're mocking him. Oh, my goodness. And all of this would unfold for them, and they're like, it's happening right now. This is what's being done. Look at this. And he is saying, I'm fulfilling the scripture. You're the fourth service. I'm expecting you to do better than everybody else. I will tell you, third service did the best so far, okay? <laughs> the answer to this next question, series of questions, is to fulfill the scripture, Okay? Everybody got it? What are, what's the answer to the next questions? I will tell you, we're, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And I will tell you that every group, third service did a little bit better, but every group around the third question goes, are we still supposed to be answering this? Yes. Okay. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Why did his parents flee Jerusalem and head to Egypt? Why was he raised in Nazareth and called a Galilean? Why did he heal the sick and raise the dead? Why did the Jews hate him? Why did he have to be crucified? Why did his hands and feet have to be pierced? Why did they have to offer him sour wine to drink? Why did they have to gamble for his clothes? Why did the people have to mock him? Why did the 11 have to flee from him and abandon him? Why did he have to be dead for three days and three nights? Why did he have to be raised from the dead? And why will he return? You guys are awesome. <laughs> Listen to me. I know, tough, right? You, it's, I thought it was pretty easy, right? But the first few services, after like number three, they're like, to, to fulfill those reference? Like, I was like, we're not changing direction, guys. It's the same thing. Here's the point, Okay. Here's the point. There had to be someone to betray Judas. You might not, sorry, betray Jesus. It was Judas. You might not know this, but Psalm 41 has a prophecy about Judas betraying Christ. It says, let the one who breaks bread with me lift his heel up against me. And after Jesus broke the bread on the last night of the life, he handed the bread to Judas. And it says, this was to fulfill the scripture that he who broke bread with me lifted his heel up against me. Psalm 69 has a prophecy about Judas betraying Christ. Psalm 109 has a prophecy about Judas betraying Christ. Psalm 69 verse 21 says, they offered, me, uh, they offered me poison food or food mixed with gall. They offered me sour wine for my drink. They offered Jesus two drinks on the cross, one mixed with gall and one with sour wine. And that's prophesied in Psalm 69, 21. Like down to details, it is prophesied about Christ. Now hear me say this. You and I don't know the Bible well enough. We just don't. We don't. And there's no excuse for it. 
But when Peter or Paul went out and when they were preaching in Jewish communities and they were preaching in the synagogues, you can be sure that they knew the scripture, which for them was the Old Testament. And when he said, look, this is how Jesus died. This is how Jesus was crucified. The Bible says of, of, of Peter, sorry, of Paul, it says that he proved from the scripture that Jesus was the Christ. So he stands in front of the people and says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Okay, check. That's where the Messiah is supposed to be born. He fled to Egypt. Check. That's where the Messiah was going to flee. He was raised in Galilee. Check. And moment, like he's able to prove from the scripture to the point of how he died and to the point of how he was raised from the dead that he was Jesus. But see, you and I don't know the scriptures. We don't know the Old Testament. So all we do is go, we read the story of Jesus on the cross and we read him saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We go, I guess God forsook him. I didn't know that could happen. And we come to conclusions that the Bible doesn't make, that the first century Jews would not have made. In fact, when he says, when Jesus says, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They don't go, God has forsaken him. You know what they say? They say he's calling out to Elijah. Let's wait and see what's about to happen. They believed he was calling to God for help. We don't take it that way. And yet it's right there in black and white in our Bible. That's how they took it. So why do we take it differently? Because we don't know the scriptures. They did. They didn't believe them. They didn't believe that Christ was the Messiah. They didn't believe that he was the Savior. They should have. But you and I need to know the scriptures. I say this all the time to our Wednesday night Bible study group. And I'll say it to you now. There is no excuse to be a stupid Christian. There's not. And, and especially since we're literate and we have the Bible in 48 different translations in 30 seconds right here on our phones. Like there's, no, there's no reason for us to not know it. There's none. It's not because you don't have the time. It's not because you're not smart enough. It's not because the Spirit of God doesn't live in you and can't teach you these things. It is because we just don't think it important. But let me ask you this question. If every single aspect of Jesus' life was a fulfillment of the Old Testament Scripture, the only, I'll tell you this, the only parts of the Scripture that Christ has not fulfilled yet, the only parts are His second coming. It's the only part He hasn't fulfilled yet. How in the world can you be prepared for that if you don't know what the Old Testament Scripture says about the second coming of Christ? Paul talks a lot about we know that Christ is coming, to be sure. But if you want to know how he's going to come and what it's going to be like, what do you need to know? The Old Testament. You need to know the prophecies that speak to that. Right? But we're just like, well, I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How can you even understand Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John if you don't understand how Christ fulfilled the Old Testament through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? If you're reading it from a 21st century perspective instead of a 1st century perspective, you've got to know the context. We have to be smarter than that. We have to be more intentional than that. And i got to tell you something. If we can look, if we would get to the place where we would look and say, look at how he fulfilled all these things in his life and his death and his resurrection perfectly, and then we would begin to see the Old Testament, how it points to the return of Christ, I, I would tell you this, you would be so excited. You would be so excited for the return of Jesus. I think part of the reason that we're not super excited about the return of Christ is because we don't understand how the scripture points to the return of Christ. And if we did, if we understood the Old Testament text about how it points to the coming of the Savior, we'll talk about some of this next week in, in, um, in Isaiah. But if, if, if we understood what the Scripture said about the return of Jesus, you wouldn't be able to contain the joy you felt about it because you'd be able to say, oh my goodness, everything he did in life, he did to fulfill this Scripture. And look at all these promises about his second coming. You would know with assurance and with confidence that every single one of those things he's going to do just as it said it was going to do. I mean, if Psalm 69, 21 can tell us the two types of drinks I have on the cross, don't you think the prophecies about how he's going to return are probably pretty precise? And so if only we could go, man, look, I, I get it. Leviticus is boring. It is. You get to the Psalms and you're like, man, at least I'm in the Psalms now. I'm, I'm not in Leviticus, you know. I'm glad to be reading the Psalms. And we look at the emotion of it and look at David's passion and look at his joy and look at his sorrow. We get out of Leviticus, we're like, that's so boring. Three pages on cleansing a leper's house. I just don't care about that, right? But hear me say this. The, 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 the doldrums of Leviticus and the emotional exuberance of Psalms both point to Jesus. Leviticus points to Christ. Psalms points to Christ. And we've got to be the kind of people that say, look, I... I don't want to just read these things and kind of get glimpses into David's life. I want to read these things and see Christ, my Savior, and my King. You will enjoy the New Testament so much more if you understand the Old Testament. You will. 
I, I truly do not know how somebody reads and understands Hebrews without understanding the Old Testament. The author of Hebrews quotes the New Testament or the Old Testament in every single chapter of Hebrews. And like half, half of the book of Hebrews is Old Testament quotes. How can you understand the book of Hebrews then if you don't understand the Old Testament? I'll just put it to you this way. If you leave here and you're mad because I don't like Turkey and you're never coming back, and you're going, we're going to find the new church, and you go to a new church, and that person is preaching the book of Hebrews to you. And when they get to those Old Testament quotes, they don't take you back to the Old Testament to show you what those quotes meant in the Old Testament. Go somewhere else. Find a different place. Because I can make up all sorts of things that sound really good and convincing. But if we'll be faithful to the text, it will faithfully reveal Jesus. So why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's preaching. And it takes a lot less effort to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Than to say, hey guys, see how they're gambling for my clothes? What does that remind you of? Hey guys, See how they're mocking me? Do you hear what they're saying? What does that remind you of? Here in a little bit, when I die, they're not going to have to break my legs, and they're going to pierce my side. What's that going to remind you of? Do you see my hands and my feet being pierced? Instead of walking them through every single thing, all he has to do is say what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And where do their hearts and their minds go? To what we call the 22nd Psalm. What did Jesus say the night before he died? You will abandon me, but what? The Father is always with me. Christian, take comfort in that. The, the father who did not forsake the son will not forsake you either. And I got off track again. Here's our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come. God, that we would know him and that we would desire the return of Jesus. Would you take a moment to pray that where you're seated, please? God, I thank you that the scripture reveals Jesus. I thank you that through the scripture we can know Christ not just about his first coming, but we can anticipate now his second coming. I thank you, God, that we who have put faith in you will never be forsaken, will never be abandoned, will never be forgotten. I thank you, God, for the confidence that we can have that just as Christ has fulfilled every single thing about his first coming, so also he will fulfill every single thing about his second coming. There's not a doubt in our mind that one day the clouds will roll back and Christ will be revealed and we will see him face to face and we look forward to that day. I thank you, God, that our righteousness does not depend upon us but depends upon you. I thank you, God, that it is by faith and not by works that we have been made whole and saved. And God, in the midst of our sadness and in the midst of our blessing, let us turn all of our affection and all of our longing towards you. And God, we say with all the saints throughout history, come, Lord Jesus, come. 